So this next part, we're going to be um, talking about uh, what we call the five priority EADs. So federal and state governments have come together and identified um, the five diseases that, based on risk assessment, will have um, the largest consequence for the Australian economy as a whole and the highest likelihood of an incursion um, within the next few years. Um, but firstly, we call it EADs. Um, I've worked in government now for two and a half years and I realise that you need a, um, a little book with all the acronyms in it and EADs is one of those, so EAD, Emergency Animal Diseases. Um, so what is an emergency animal disease? Um, it's a disease that's considered by the Australian government and industry, um, as I said, to be of national significance due to serious or severe impacts on a number of factors. Um, so it's likely to have significant effects on animal health and potentially resulting in livestock deaths, production loss, and in some cases, human health and the environment. Uh, they have an impact on our ability to trade and negatively impact the economy, which I think you'll soon find, particularly if we have foot and mouth disease, that's, a, um, that's a, quite a big understatement. Uh, also, animal health issues, animal welfare issues. I think we get so bogged down thinking about the economic impacts of these diseases um, I know last week at our district vet conference, um, Peter Windsor, who a lot of you would know, uh, spoke about lumpy skin disease and the work he's done in Indonesia on that. And it was just, from a welfare perspective, just devastating. So we do have to look at the animal welfare implications of these diseases as well. Um, an EAD may be a known disease. It may be a variant of an endemic disease, um, or it may be a new disease to Australia. Uh, national and state government plans exist for responsive management of EADs, and these are AUSVET plans, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, they're all available on the Animal Health Australia website, um, as well as supporting documents such as um, documents around decontamination and, um, and other areas like that. Um, makes for interesting reading, um, if you've got a spare half an hour up your sleeve. Um, the foot and mouth disease document um, in particular um, it's very comprehensive, very readable, um, and I think you'll find it, um, if you did have a look at it, you, you actually learn quite a lot about the disease itself. I know I certainly did. Um, FMD is classified as a Category 2 disease in terms of funding if an outbreak should happen. 80% um, of that funding will be supplied by government and 20% supplied by industry. Um, so all these diseases are put into different categories in terms of funding um, should a response be needed. So how are these EADs managed in New South Wales? Um, if you look at the Biosecurity Act, there's a schedule in it that lists all what we call prohibited matter. And these emergency animal diseases are included as, as prohibited matter. And as Liz said, um, all our district vets and biosecurity officers in local land services are all authorised officers under the Biosecurity Act, which gives us special powers if we suspect um, a property has animals with um, certain diseases that come under prohibited matter, we can actually enter that property, take samples, um, request information from the owner under the Biosecurity Act. So it gives us additional legal powers um, to respond if we suspect that something is amiss. Uh, there's that phone number again. Um, if you don't know who your local district vet is, please come and see me during the break and I can tell you who they are and um, give you their phone number. Certainly. Um, We've got that 24 hour number as well. So if you're stuck, um, me mind you, on a Saturday morning, we've had private vets bringing our district vets and God love them, they still answer their phones. So um, if you um, ring the district vet, ring the hotline, get in touch with us if you see anything suspicious, um, then that's your first port of call. Um, so under the Biosecurity Act, there are a number of different um, clinical signs that we see that are declared biosecurity events, um, and it is a, a legal responsibility for those events to be reported to us. Um, so for obvious reasons, the appearance of ulcers or blisters on the mouth or feet of ruminants or pigs, um, the appearance of skin nodules on cattle, obviously for lumpy skin disease concerns, um, an unexplained or significant increase in a mortality or morbidity rate in plants or animals, 
Um, unexplained and significant fall in production relating to plants or animals. So, um, for example, if you're preg testing and there's low repro rates that you um, can't explain, then that would be a declared biosecurity event and something that really probably should be investigated. Um, ap appearance of other unexplained or significant clinical signs in animals, including but not limited to unexplained neurological signs or conditions. Um, and that's, you know, we're, we're looking at horses as well, so things like Hendra virus, obviously we're concerned about. Um, and we are very good in this region. Um, I've noticed a lot of the horse vets um, will do Hendra exclusions on horses with either colic or neurological signs. So full credit to the horse vets out there for taking that on board. You will hear a lot about sampling and lab testing today. Um, and you'll get a lot of practice in doing that in the practical sessions, um, which is um, something that you really should make the most of that opportunity. Um, it's really important that sampling um, is conducted correctly, so the lab can obviously give you the best chance of an accurate diagnosis. There's those phone numbers again. Um, if you've got samples that you um, suspect um, will need an EAD exclusion testing, please call EMAI or call that 1800 number uh, because we need to give the lab um, notice that these samples are coming in. Also, if a disease is zoonotic, they like for you to ring them and just let them know um, and to, to make sure uh, the samples are well and truly labelled potential zoonoses for obvious workplace health and safety reasons. Um, if you need assistance over the phone assistance um, or if you need any kind of materials for sampling that you know, you might need media that you do not have, please call your district vet because quite often we have media available um, that's on hand and we can get it to you or you can come and pick it up from one of our offices. That's, a, that's not a problem. So our top five priority EADs. Um, interesting to note that um, Japanese encephalitis is not on this list and it was a big surprise when it hit us last year. Um, two piggeries in our region were two of the first piggeries that were diagnosed with it and it was, um, it was actually quite um, great work by the pathologists at EMAI to diagnose it because it was the last thing anyone suspected. Um, so even though these are the priority EADs, there's lots of EADs out there that we need to be aware of. So if you're seeing anything that just doesn't make sense, if you're doing testing that comes back negative for all the regular things, please call the pathologists at EMAI. They are fantastic. And um, they might suggest further testing for things that are less common, but we need to rule out. So the top five priority EADs are obviously foot and mouth disease, a big one that we're all wor worried about, uh, lumpy skin disease, African swine fever, African horse sickness, and highly pathogenic avian influenza. So back in March 2021, the University of Melbourne did a risk analysis and found uh, the risk of an incursion within the next five years of African swine fever, African horse sickness, foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. Um, and you can see those figures there. Um, and they suggested that there was a 42% probability of an incursion of one of these diseases in Australia in the next five years. Um, highly pathogenic avian influenza was not on there because the year before that was conducted, Victoria had actually um, had a HPAI outbreak, which is obviously now uh, resolved. So that was in 2021, but going back to just over 12 months, um, when foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease were both diagnosed in Indonesia, um, those risk analyses were, um, were conducted again. And obviously being geographically closer to Australia, the risk of those diseases coming into the country um, did increase. So lumpy skin disease went from 8% to a 28% risk of an incursion in the next five years. Um, foot and mouth disease, so there was a lot of media attention around this happening in Indonesia and people demanding that, um, you know, people coming back from Bali had to um, give up their footwear and things like that. Um, 
the actual risk of foot and mouth disease coming into Australia didn't go up that much higher. So it went from 9% to 12%. Um, and the reason that lumpy skin disease is obviously higher is because it's vector borne um, rather than coming on the back of um, contaminated meat products, which is the most likely way we're going to get a foot and mouth disease incursion. The impacts of an incursion, uh, particularly with foot and mouth disease, would be devastating. So we estimate $80 billion over 10 years. Um, that's based on export markets being shut down overnight um, and internal damage um, to the Australian economy as well. Um, there will be obviously community impacts, so um, small communi rural communities that depend on, on farming um, will be obviously be adversely affected. Um, social wellbeing, financial hardship, um, it will also hurt supporting systems and of course the animal welfare component as well. Um, lumpy skin disease would cost about $8 billion in the first year um, and African swine fee would cost about $2 billion over five years. So um, this is why it's so important that we're aware of these diseases and that we're, um, we're alert to any clinical signs that we may see to get them tested and excluded. Um, and the exclusion tests are just as important as the inclusion tests, so then we can continue to prove freedom of disease to our export partners. Um, so if you see anything suspicious, even if it's sort of low suspicion, then please do, a, do an exclusion test um, just so we can add to that data. Um, so foot and mouth disease um, is obviously a very serious, highly contagious viral disease affecting cloven hoofed animals. Uh, there's seven serotypes and there's a lack of cross protection between serotypes. Um, Incubation is variable depending on the strain, the dose, the husbandry and animal variables such as immunology um, as well as route of transmission. Um, infected animals excrete virus that's probably a better slide to look at. Excrete the virus in the fluid from ruptured vesicles, um, exhaled hair, air, saliva, milk, semen, feces, and urine. Uh, the primary mode of transmission is by direct contact and fomites or movement of animals or windborne spread. Uh, it, can be, it can remain viable in the environment uh, for weeks or even longer. Um, it's highly susceptible to both acid and alkaline disinfectants, um, which is why we stocked up on a lot of citric acid um, for our decontamination kits, um, because that change in pH really does inactivate the virus. Um, it can survive in frozen, chilled and freeze-dried foods, including meat and dairy. Um, and this is obviously the biggest concern for Australia is imported products coming in, um, those products then being fed to pigs. Pigs are an amplifier of the virus um, and that's how they contract the virus. So a pig will shed about three times as many viral particles as an infected cow um, and this is the most likely way that this disease will come into the country is through infected um, contaminated food products. So this is a, um, a map that is fairly recent, March this year. Um, showing the spread of foot and mouth disease globally. Um, those countries that aren't coloured actually don't report, so they don't have an official status. Um, so it's probably best to assume that there is foot and mouth disease in those countries rather to assume that um, it isn't. Um, as you can see, Australia is currently FMD free and a vaccination free status. Um, so it is important um, that we maintain that vaccination free status and that will um, play a part in how we respond to an incursion. So obviously vaccines will be a part of a response should it be needed. Um, but the sooner that we can um, be declared as free of disease without vaccination, that will open up more export markets for us again. So, um, so obviously the planning for a response and how we use vaccines in particular in that response will be uh, will be crucial in terms of how we will come out of the response at the other end. Uh, so whenever you see vesicles in cloven hoofed animals, um, you should do an FMD exclusion. If you're not sure how to do that, 
ring your district vet, ring that 1800 number and we can step you through what samples to collect. Um, and obviously today our pathology team will take you through a bit more about what samples that they need. Um, a provisional diagnosis should be made if there's a combination of the following signs. So acute lameness in a group of animals. Um, lameness is actually, um, particularly in sheep, is something that um, needs to be reported to district vets um, for a variety of reasons. Foot and mouth disease um, is one of them, but also um, virulent foot rot being a, a regulated disease in New South Wales. So any signs of lameness, um, please alert the district vet about it. Um, excess salivation, vesicles in the mouth, um, on the feet or on the teats, fever and a drop in milk yield. Um, so morbidity of foot and mouth disease often reaches 100%. Uh, mortality is quite low except in younger stock. Um, as I said before, pigs are more susceptible to oral transmission than aerosols, so they're more likely to get it through eating contaminated foods. Uh, that's why swill feeding is illegal, so for that reason and also African swine fever. Um, and we regularly conduct swill feeding audits, particularly on people with one or two pigs in the backyard that might just throw them the, um, the food scraps. And if it's got meat in the food scraps, particularly things like uh, bacon, ham that might have come in from overseas, um, then that's um, considered swill feeding and it's something that we take very seriously. Um, so that's why you might see a lot of um, media attention around swill feeding, particularly if you follow us on things like Facebook. Um, cattle are an indicator species. Um, they're highly susceptible to aerosol infection and the clinical signs are very overt um, in cattle. In sheep, clinical signs aren't as, um, aren't as overt as they are in, in cattle, but it is some, still something to be aware of. Um, they're equally as susceptible to the virus, but just don't show up those signs. So as you can imagine, going through those clinical signs, there's lots of differential diagnoses for foot and mouth disease. So um, for example, I know our district vet in Gundagai towards the end of last year was called to a property up near Tumut um, where there were vesicles um, in a couple of steers up there. Um, she did obviously a foot and mouth disease exclusion as you would. Uh, it turned out that um, they were persistently infected so it was um, mucosal disease. Um, so common things occur co commonly, as we know in the vet world, um, but if you do see something like that, please contact us and we can help you rule out FMD. Lumpy skin disease, it's another disease that we've heard a lot of over the last 12 months. Um, unlike foot and mouth disease, lumpy skin disease only affects cattle and buffalo. Um, it's also a viral disease. Um, the incubation period's around 4 to 14 days, usually less than 28 days. Um, and it causes anything from severe systemic disease with clinical signs. It could, be, um, it could be in apparent disease to really marked disease. So I'm pretty sure there's some pictures coming up. It's um, it's a horrendous disease to see um, and the effects it has on the animals, it makes them incredibly unwell. Um, it's a vector-borne virus that's spread primarily by biting insects. Um, contaminated feed, water vehicles and iatrogenic means can also spread the virus. So this is where lumpy skin disease is from 2022. So I think it was March, Feb February or March last year um, when it was first diagnosed. Um, in Indonesia. Um, obviously we're on high alert for that in the northern parts of the country given it's, um, given it's vector borne um, with the right wind directions then, um, then it is possible for that to, to jump that small distance across into northern Australia. Um, but in saying that um, every Monday morning at the Wagga cattle sales we have an LLS staff member either one of our vets or our biosecurity officers um, going and inspecting all the cattle that go through the sales and that's being done statewide through um, local land services at the moment. Um, we haven't had to do any exclusions here but I know in around Hunter, North Coast, they've had to do exclusions of cattle going through sale yards that it's often just from 
um, buffalo fly or other biting insects. Um, obviously, no LSD cases yet, um, but they have had to do exclusions on that. So it is obviously something that we're doing active surveillance on. Um, clinical signs of lumpy skin disease are fever, um, depression. These animals are, are highly unwell. Um, nasal and ocular discharges, um, swelling of the limbs, lameness, reluctance to move and eat, um, enlarged superficial lymph nodes, reduced milk production, and skin lumps. And the skin lumps actually occurs late in the duration of the disease. So it's more the depression, um, the fever are the initial signs, and then you start seeing these lumps develop. Uh, morbidity can be up to 45%. Uh, mortality, again, is quite low, similar to foot and mouth disease, so 1% to 5%. Um, but from a welfare perspective, it is a devastating disease. Um, just that presentation last week of Peter Wins has really highlighted to me um, how nasty this disease would be if it came into Australia. Again, lots of differentials. Um, we had one of our district vets um, up in the north of the state do a rule out of lumpy skin disease of a cow that was in a feedlot. Um, turned out the cow had um, cutaneous lymphoma. Um, so that was a, an interesting one-off case, but obviously lots of differentials can appear for lumpy skin disease as well. So African swine fever. Um, that's a severe infectious hemorrhagic viral disease, obviously affecting pigs. Um, it has an incubation period of usually less than 20 days. Um, it's spread by direct contact within herds and indirectly through ingestion of contaminated material. Um, there was an ASF outbreak in um, Timor-Leste um, not too long ago, and that was discovered to be um, because there were products from contaminated products coming in from China that were dumped there. Um, they were very cheap products, so the local um, pig producers would take those and feed them to their pigs and ended up, unfortunately, with African swine fever in those pigs. Um, so again, another reason why we like to do school feeding orders. Um, pigs recovered, um, they recover from either acute or chronic infections. They may become persistently infected, acting as virus carriers. Uh, ticks can act as reservoirs and biological vectors, um, and the virus can remain um, viable for very long periods. Um, there's currently no vaccine or treatment for it. Oh, so this is a relatively recent, well, very recent map um, of the distribution of African swine fever. Um, very much a sort of African Eurasian disease at the moment, but it is one of those diseases that is um, getting closer and closer to Australia. Um, that's why it's one of our top five diseases, uh, particularly around the impact that we'll have to our pork industry. So these are some of the clinical signs. I'm not sure how many of you would, you'd probably see cattle and sheep more often than you'd see pigs, um, but um, you know, you can't rule out having to go off and, and see a pig if someone has one or two pigs that is displaying signs like this. Um, so the pigs might um, be in the per acute form of the disease and just be found dead. Um, the acute form, um, as you can imagine, high fever, depression, anorexia. Um, I have heard this disease being described as the Ebola virus of the pig world. Liz, would you? <laughs> say that that sounds <laughs> yeah so the the reports initially of the cases in china and, and people that were overseas seeing it over in those situations where it's a slow burn usually in the piggery so it starts off as just a few um you know cases which could be mistaken for traditional pig problems i guess as a lot but then they went out the next morning or four days later and they had an entire pen um, either dead or lying down, and if you try and disturb them, some of the videos I've seen where if any of you have walked into a piggery, the whole pen gets up and wants to find out what the heck's going on. Um, in the cases where it was clinical in, in these farms, the pen, it took a lot to rouse them and get them on their feet, and if you turned your back, within 30 seconds to a minute, they were laying down again. So when it hits that high peak level, um, you'll very much notice something's wrong in the piggery. 
but it can be mistaken early while it's building up enough momentum in the finger. Yep. So you do get um, hemorrhages in the skin. It can cause abortions. Uh, and its mortality rates are up to 100%. So obviously this is um, one of the main reasons why ASF would be such a, a huge financial burden to the pork industry in Australia. So again, lots of differentials and, you know, these differentials are probably more likely to be the cause of any of these signs that you see. But please um, let us know if you're seeing these signs so we can do an ASF exclusion um, test. Um, African horse sickness um, has really started to spread um, into our part of the world, traditionally obviously mainly seen in Africa, um, but um, with the spread of it being vector-borne, it has come across to, um, to various parts of Asia. Um, it's a highly pathogenic arbovirus, so spread by, um, by midges. Um, it can cause severe, often fatal circulatory and respiratory disease. Um, horses are obviously most severely affected, uh, but all equine species, donkeys, mules, zebras, they're all susceptible to it. Um, disease with mortality has been observed in dogs following ingestion of infected meat material. Um, and the virus, it survives a few hours in carcasses, but it's pretty easily inactivated um, once the animal starts to decompose. So this is the spread of it. So as I said, um, Africa was the, uh, the main location for it for many years, but it has um, started to spread. Um, and then we've started to see cases of it. Um, I think that's Malaysia? No, Thailand. 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 It's hard to see from this angle. Um, clinical signs of um, African horse sickness are pretty, um, are pretty distressing, especially as we know um, horse owners in particular love their animals, um, so this would be devastating for them to see. Uh, there's four recognised clinical presentations. There's horse sickness fever, uh, which occurs in previously exposed immune horses with just mild fever malaise, um, and you get this edema above the eyes too. But if it came into Australia, obviously because it's a, um, not here at the moment, we would probably see more marked clinical signs than this. So there's the cardiac form uh, where the horses will get a fever and subcutaneous edema. Edema is the main clinical signs with a mortality rate of up to 50%. Uh, the pulmonary form uh, where they get markedly depressed, a fever, um, severe dys dyspnea, um, spasmodic coughing, um, nasal discharge and a mortality rate of 95%. Uh, there's quite a few viruses that need to be excluded um, if you are going to see a horse like this. This is where you will want to use the PPE in the kits that you will be receiving this afternoon um, because something with um, with signs like this, and if you put neurological signs on top of it, you'd be wanting to do a Hendra exclusion. Um, so please make the use of those PPE kits that you'll be getting at the end of the day. Um, and the mixed form is the most common form. That's a combination of both cardiac and pulmonary, pulmonary signs uh, with a mortality rate of up to 80%. So these are those differential diagnoses. As I said, Hendra virus is probably um, from a, a zoonotic point of view, the one that we want to be careful for and the one that we're really looking out for um, in this region. We haven't had any cases of Hendra um, in our region, um, but it's always important to do exclusions. And the last one on the list is highly pathogenic avian influenza, which has come into Australia previously, but we've managed to eradicate each time it's come in. Um, again, it's a highly infectious viral disease. We're starting to see a pattern here, I think. Um, humans are susceptible to avian influenza, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. There is low pathogenic and high pathogenic. Uh, we've had eight outbreaks since 1976, so the most recent one was in Victoria in 2020, and it was around Young and Cowra. When was that, 2013? 
Um, outbreaks are likely to occur via wild birds contaminating water or food supplies for poultry or directly contaminating range areas. Um, so free range farms in particular are at high risk um, given their exposure to wild birds. Um, and obviously it's very hard for us to control wild bird migratory populations. Um, infection spreads through the movements of infected live birds or faecally contaminated eggs, uh, feed, equipment, materials, clothing and footwear. Um, so as you can see, there are a few um, events that have gone on recently. Um, I can't see anything going on in Australia at the moment, which is always good, and um, I was hoping that there wouldn't be. So the clinical signs, um, the peracute form, um, are really just birds dying suddenly. Um, if you're not confident with doing bird post-mortems. Is there anyone from EMAI still here? I might get in trouble for saying this. <laughs> you, can, you can send them whole birds um, if you're not confident in sampling. Um, I know some of my district vets have done that. Uh, the acute form is severe respiratory signs, um, cyanosis, um, edema, um, ischemic necrosis of the cones and wattles, um, hemorrhages, um, ocular and nasal discharges, egg drop syndrome, a sudden decline in feed and or water consumption. So as you can see, um, they're pretty non-specific signs. So it could be a number of things occurring, but again, and I'm gonna keep saying it, always important to do exclusions because that's the only way that we're going to find out if we do have something like this um, as an outbreak. Subacute and chronic forms are respiratory signs, discharges, uh, swollen sinuses, decreased egg production. Uh, morbidity and mortality is quite low in these subacute and chronic forms. And again, a very long list of differential diagnoses that we have to consider. Um, most of these are obviously much more common, but again, we need to rule it out. There's that number again. I told you you'd see lots of times today. Um, so look, early detection is critical. Um, as I said at the beginning of the talk, we have district vets throughout the Riverina, but um, we also rely on private vets because you guys are out there as eyes and ears and all the other senses out on farms. You're seeing much more of what's going on. Um, you're more likely to do routine visits to farms and we are and can pick up on things that farmers might have overlooked. Um, so we need you to be alert to these things so you can um, do an investigation for those and we're always here to help you. Um, so over the phone, the 1800 number, get the phone number of your local district vet or that 1300 number um, that will go through to one of our offices and you'll get the number from there. So um, yeah, if you need any help, if you're out in the field and you need a hand, either ring your district vet or ring that 1800 number. Um, and we can certainly be of help with the samples that you have to collect um, and the next steps to take. Um, and please make sure you take all your equipment with you when you go out on calls in case you need to, to don up into PPE gear. And after today, you will all be experts in that too. <laughs>